hear now passages from the Word, as well as from a section uh, from Ecclesiastes at the end of sections from the Old and New Testament and from the Word given to the New Church. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dis dismayed, I am your God. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. When a person passes into the next life, she does not lose any of the things that she possesses as a person. She retains and has with her every single thing except the body which had hampered her in the interior exercise of her capacities. Conjugal love in its essence is nothing else but the wish of two to become one. In other words, the will of the one to be also the will of the other that they may become one life. A person can hear, speak, see, as they did in the previous world. A person can walk, run, sit. They can lie down, they sleep, they wake up in the other world. They can eat and drink, as they had done in the previous world. In short, a person is in every single respect still a person, a human being. It's obvious from this that Death is not an extinction, but a continuation of life. It is merely a passing over. People who enter heaven come into a state similar to their adolescence. That is, they are summoned back into states similar in innocence to the beginning of their first loves as they were maturing. Into states of innocence and charity and the affection for truth which are accompanied by their every delight, indescribably increased now in the other world. In heaven, those who are moved by mutual love are constantly approaching the springtime of their youth. And this process continues to eternity, bringing increase in joy and happiness. Those of the female sex who had died worn out with age, but who had lived a life of love and faith in the Lord, and charity towards their neighbor are brought into happy conjugal love with their husbands and as the years pass they become more and more like they were in the first flower of their youth and early womanhood and into a beauty that excels all ideas of beauty capable of the imagination in the natural world. All spirits as soon as they enter the other life are recognized by their friends and their relatives and acquaintances Afterwards, they talk to one another and mingle together just as they had done in the natural world. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I will give them eternal life and none shall perish. And I... I will draw all people to myself. Come, let us return to the Lord. He will heal us. He will bind us up. After two days, He will revive us. And on the third day, He will raise us up that we may live in His sight. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill. A time to heal. A time to break down. A time to build up. A time to weep. A time to laugh. A time to mourn. A time to dance. A time to cast away stones. 
a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. Amen. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for every ever. These words from the 23rd Psalm seem to beautifully encapsulate Evelyn's humble and trusting attitude in the Lord working in her life. She was a person who was content with her lot and her dispensations in divine providence. So we're here gathered today to remember the life of Evelyn Jane Barber Romero, her life in this world, and to mark her passing into a life of useful service in the spiritual world. It's a time of some sadness and also a time of great joy. A time of sadness because we have to say goodbye to this gentle, sweet, genuine, caring woman. However, it is a time of joy because we know that her usefulness is just beginning to grow anew in the next world. While old age gradually hampered her capacity to serve and love in the ways that she was accustomed to, in the next life, she will be back to her full strength and grace of both mind and body and become ready to serve again. Evelyn was born to parents Percy and Grace Barber. Percy was originally from England and Grace from Kitchener. She was born at home, 114 Galley Avenue in Parkdale, Toronto. The family attended the original location of the Olivet Church and Day School on Elm Grove in Parkdale, where she and her brother Don later returned to grow and learn even more in later life. Evelyn is perhaps the first person to enter life spiritually through baptism at that location, as well as to exit life on earth at the same Toronto address. Although Don says she's probably not going to be the only one. She was the youngest of four siblings, Lorna Woodall being the oldest, Catherine or Kay Longstaff, and Donald. As a child, she called her brother Donnie, and, his, and her nickname was E.B. She says it was because it was quicker than saying Evelyn Barber, and her siblings and friends used that nickname when she was younger. Evelyn had a great love of cats, so we are told. Although in an early diary discovered by which one of you nieces? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, she wrote that her father wouldn't let her have any pets. Didn't approve of them. Well, I guess once that time was over, she went and had her cats. Obviously her love of animals won out, and she had one or two or more constant companions throughout her life. The barber nieces, the barber nieces especially remember Canuto? Yes, a lovable cat that, cat that lived into ripe old age and large of body capacity. Especially big fellow. Evelyn completed four years of high school in Ontario. At the time there was a five-year program. She is mentioned among some other Olivet students in New Church Life of September 1944. Now, some of you might need to do the math on this. Help me out here, but there's sort of a trick part to this presentation of the service here. Five students who went to Bernathan were Evelyn Barber, Corona Carswell, Joan McDonald. Any Joan McDonalds here? Joyce Carter and Phil Bellinger. It was an all-time high record to have 19 Canadians attending the Academy schools this year. In addition to five from Toronto, there were 11 from Kitchener, two from Windsor, and one from Simcoe. Now later, Vera Craigie announced that, quote, in our October news report, we did something very terrible. 
We sent the wrong Miss Barber to our school in Bernathan. Please believe us, it was Catherine, not Evelyn, who was there. Our deep apologies, but maybe we are just being ahead of our time for once. Because indeed, Evelyn did go down to the academy just uh, a few years later, obviously. It was in the mid-40s that she was involved with the Olivet Society life. And in the news of 1948, it is reported that she was among her contemporaries as being elected into an official capacity. The officials of that year were Mr. Tom Bond as the uh, secretary, R.S. Anderson, treasurer, Charles White, finance, Robert Brown, Joseph Knight, Frank Longstaff, Sidney Parker, and Ernest Zorn. The auditor was Thomas Fountain. The House Committee, Jay Parker. Social Committee, Marion Swam, Francis Raymond, Ivan Scott, Phil Bellinger, I believe that P. Bellinger would be, Miss Vera Craigie, and the business manager, Ernest Zorn. Finally, Stephanie Starkey and Evelyn Barber. Among her contemporaries and her elders, serving the society in 1948, onward and off, on and off. She attended the Bernathan College for two years. She graduated in what we would now call an associate degree. At that time, they called it a junior college degree. In 1952, we read the names of James Boatman, Alonzo Eccles, Donald Fitzpatrick, Richard Gerwitz, Hubert Heinrich. Now, I know many of you people won't recognize these names, but some of you will. It's good to kind of place Evelyn among some of the people that she knew and loved and attended school with. Thomas Steen, Harold Lindruth. The women that graduated that year were Gwenda Acton, Natalie Allen, Evelyn Barber, that's who we're speaking about, Barbara Barnett, Ruth Brown, Gertrude Hazen. I'm not sure how to spell, pronounce Gladwin, Hicks. Gladys Starkey, and Marcia Trimble. Some of her contemporaries. Some people, some of you will recognize the names of, and others are going, okay, I hope that's the end of that part of the service. She entered the business world after graduating from college. She began working for Crown Life Insurance Company until she got married. During those early years, when she was a member of the Olivet Society and serving, she was the head of the Chancel Guild. And she re filled that responsibility until she was married. Meg and Gabrielle recall their first meeting of Evelyn upon their visit to Canada just before Don and Anne were married in 63. They came to visit Galley Avenue in the winter there, coming from Bernathan. They had not yet experienced a Canadian winter. It was cold, so they say. Tall and beautiful Evelyn welcomed them and they immediately loved this sweet, gentle person. They were later remember at Dawn and Anne's wedding in Bernathan that she looked especially gorgeous. And you'll see from the pictures downstairs what a beautiful woman she is and was and, and how she looked so, so beautiful in those early years as well as her later ones. Evelyn and Isaac, although it's Isaac, Isaac, Romero married at the Olivet Church in 1964. Isak worked as an international reinsurance person. And Don explained to me, he said, that's where like, a lot of insurance companies come together to insure something really big, like the Empire State Building. No one insurance company wants to do that. So other insurance companies, I don't understand the insurance business, but it's good that Isak did. And he was called to work in New York City to be a reinsurer and Evelyn and he moved there after they got married. They lived in a town called Ozing Ing, New York, a few miles up the Hudson River from New York City. And they built a great circle of friends. They loved to entertain. Evelyn was a talented seamstress and she sewed many of her own clothing, have many patterns from those stylish 60s days that she would uh, accomplish through her seamstressness. Isaac was from Spain, and they had many holidays and travels in Spain, Portugal, Peru, among other places. After Isaac retired, they put a basement under their Lake Kuchiching cottage and winterized it so they could live there permanently, and they enjoyed their country life with their cats 
and their beautiful garden on the lake. Although Evelyn never had children of her own, she was very fond of her nieces and her nephews. She took an interest in all of them. She was never afraid of the commute from Aurelia to Toronto and joined family here for many holidays, dinners and festive gatherings. We're told that the old mill was a favorite celebration spot. She got together with her sister Lorna and Fred, their husband in Lake jo their, their cottage in Lake Joseph, as well as Don and Ann and also Kay and Fred, Longstaff. They would all meet up. They all enjoyed their cottage lives. When their cottage life became too much for her on her own, she moved into a retirement residence in Aurelia, still on the lake with beautiful views of the water. Family would visit for lunch and take her out to the Mariposa Market for shopping and cinnamon buns. On those trips, the favorite thing was to watch her face light up with joy when she would see a child, and she loved children. Dawn was a faithful visitor to her through many, many years of her living a distance from him and him finding his way to visit her and show his love and care for his sister. Later years, she needed more constant care as her dementia advanced. She moved into the Grenadier in Toronto where Dawn and Anne lived. She still recognized Dawn, perhaps the last face that she could recognize as dementia took over. She responded to him. She loved to be held, hold his hand and be close to him. She passed away peacefully at the Elm Grove Avenue apartment, the same location as that church I mentioned earlier. What a small world. She maintained her gentle disposition throughout her life, even during her final years of dementia. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will make you master over many. Amen.